Hi, I'm Tim Major. I'm a science fiction and horror writer. And um, thanks to the BSFA for inviting me to do a reading today. Um, we're, I'm 13 weeks into lockdown at the moment and um, needing a haircut as much as anyone. Um, I work free, as a freelance editor, so I work from home normally. So life isn't so different, except for the fact that my two young kids are in the house all the time and I'm homeschooling them along with my wife. Um, so appropriately enough, um, it ties in with my new novel called Hope Island, which is about children and parenthood, which is definitely uppermost on my mind at the moment. And um, so, yeah, Hope Island has just come out just uh, a week ago at the time of recording this. Um, and it's about a British mother and her daughter who visit Hope Island in off the coast of Maine in an attempt to reconnect. Um, and on the island are creepy children. Um, the book was initially a kind of response to John Wyndham's uh, The Midwich Cuckoos, which was um, one of the books that got me into science fiction back at the age of 11, I would say. Um, so yeah, John Wyndham book's very important me, to me, along with H.G. Wells, that sort of thing. Um, but the book goes into weirder territory. So there are creepy children on the island. There are, there are also strange archaeological sites. Um, there are murders. Uh, and increasingly, as I was writing the book, another theme kind of came in along with communication between the mother and her, her daughter, but also the idea of silence as... Uh, a comfort and a threat. Um, so the bit that I'm going to read from today is about Nina, the uh, the mother, who is taken to this strange archaeological site by Clay, who is a Finnish member of a strange artistic community on the site on the on the island, and he is showing her this strange phenomenon in the in an underground cavern. So here we go. Here we are, Clay announced suddenly, startling her. He hopped onto a wide, disc-shaped boulder, the only large protuberance in an otherwise barren landscape. I assumed we were heading to the lighthouse. Lighthouse is disabled. This is where I headed to. The clumsy statement struck Nina as strangely profound. This is where I headed to. A statement that was always true, in a way, but coming from Clay, it seemed an expression of deliberate intent. If she applied the same logic to herself, it would come out slightly altered and more passive. This is where I am now. What is it you wanted to show me, Nina said. Clay didn't answer. Instead, he tapped the boulder with his stick, and then he rose, turned, and pushed the stick beneath one edge of the boulder. Take some push, he grunted. He worked the stick further into the crevice beneath, between the rock and the dry, packed soil. Then he took a breath and pressed downwards. The boulder lifted a fraction. Clay renewed his grip and then heaved. The rock moved. In a single fluid motion, Clay released the stick and then, in a flash, his hands were beneath the boulder, his fingers scrabbling for purchase as he eased it aside. Soon he was able to use the weight of the rock to assist him. The boulder flipped over and landed with a thud that Nina felt in her knees. Clay wiped his forehead. I wasn't 100%. I can do it. Mikhail helped me always. I could have helped if you told me what you were doing. He shrugged. For a moment, Nina considered accusing him of sexism, but a curiosity won out. Where the boulder had been was a hole, roughly the dimensions of a coffin. The rock had been a lid. Clay pulled a battered smartphone from his pocket. Its screen was a lattice of cracks. You have phone too? Yes. I haven't been able to get any reception. Clay prodded at the screen with his index finger. Nina blinked as a bright pinprick of light shone from its back. It is dark down there, Clay said. And with that, he walked confidently into the hole. The sight made her laugh out loud in her confusion. Standing to one side, at first she didn't register that Clay was actually descending. Instead, she thought of an illusion that Rob used to perform for the delighted young Laurie. He would stride behind the sofa, bending with each step, pretending to go down non-existent stairs. Laurie would clap and call him back, and there he would be, rising out of the floor. But Clay really was going into the earth. Soon, he disappeared entirely. Nina squinted up at the sun and then looked at the hole. She could see the first step, dark, packed soil, but nothing more. She flicked on her phone torch. She took a step into the dark. 
The passage was narrow, with no more than a few centimetres of space either side of her shoulders. The tail of her jacket scraped lightly against the packed earth as she descended. She aimed the torch downwards. Clay was nowhere to be seen. It's not far, his voice echoed oddly, reverberating more than seemed right. She heard a strange crunching sound too. Nina plodded on, taking care to find her footing on each rough step. The bulk of the headphones around her neck made a brace that prevented her from looking directly down. The torchlight seemed to dim. She flipped her phone around and then squeaked at the intensely bright light shining in her eyes. She blinked to dispel the green ghosts on her retinas. When she shone the torch ahead again, she realised that it had seemed dimmer because it was no longer picking out the shapes of steps or the narrow passage. She'd reached the bottom and the light now dispersed into a wide cavern. It was about 10 metres in diameter, roughly circular, perhaps two metres in height. Clay stood in its centre, the top of his head only a hair's breadth from the roof. For a moment, Nina forgot about the journey from the gravel circle within the sanctuary buildings to here, and imagined one above the other, as if they descended directly to this underworld equivalent. It is impressive, Clay said, purely a statement of fact. Nina shone the torch around. Thin roots protruded from the black, low ceiling. The wall shone with lichen, pale, sickly, greenish white, the colour of cabbage white butterflies. Up is okay, Clay said, but down is better. Nina pointed the torch down to see that Clay was standing on a thin board placed above the surface of the cavern. But it was what lay either side of the board that commanded Nina's attention. At first, she thought they were ceramic pots, broken like landfill, and then she took them to be something softer, like plate fungus. She bent down to examine those nearest to her. The larger objects were smooth white stones, cousins of the disc-shaped boulder that had formed the trapdoor to the cavern. The smaller items were shells. Some were intact, but most were smashed, their sharp edges rising like tiny stalagmites. There must have been hundreds of them, thousands. Some she recognised as mollusk, mollusk shells, others oysters. With a lurch in her stomach, Nina registered other pointed shapes rising from the chaos. Thin bones. The cavern was a pit of white knives. Nina heard the whooshing of blood pumping in her ears. It is nothing you should be afraid, Clay said loudly. Nina winced at the volume of his voice and its peculiar soft echo, as if he were shouting in a cathedral. It's called a shell midden. It's not so unusual in these islands. How old is it? Depends. Top layer is maybe 1,000 years. Lower is older. Many thousands of years. Many. So it was what? Some kind of processing site for food? Is that it? Clay shrugged. So people say. I've heard of shell middens. I saw a documentary once. But I don't understand. I thought they were normally found at ground level, beside rivers or on the coast. Another shrug. Hope Island is coast all around. But we're up on the cliff, not at sea level. So the oyster shells and all the rest. She peered again at the animal bones would have to have been brought up here, and then down these steps into a cave. I don't get it. Nina scaife. Perhaps you look too much. You look and don't listen. That shut her up. Clay continued. Wind has died down out there. We will wait. Then you will hear what made me fall in love at Hope Island. What made me listen to the world. Come to me. Nina made her way along the wooden board to join him. She grimaced at the sound of cracking beneath the wood as she put her weight upon it. The siblings had laid the plank directly on top of the shells, the artefacts. Clay lowered himself to sit cross-legged upon the board. Nina copied him. They faced one another and waited. Nina glanced over her shoulder at the passageway that led up to the surface, the only way out. Now, Clay announced, listen. She watched his face, his closed eyes. She pulled her headphones over her ears and checked that the mini-disc player was still recording. At first, she thought the sound was coming from Clay the om of a Buddhist or a yoga enthusiast. She turned, and the movement of her head helped her locate the source of the groan. It was coming from the passageway. Her eyes widened. Had somebody followed them? But there were no footsteps. It was only the wind. She turned from side to side, tracking the sound. It seemed to travel around the wall of the cavern. She remembered a water slide Laurie and Rob had once insisted that she try, which had deposited her into a disc-shaped enclosure in total darkness, and she'd been flung around and around like a coin in a dish, gaining speed until she'd fallen shouting from a hole in its middle. She looked down now to reassure herself that there was no hole in the floor of the cavern. 
The groaning air swung around her. She could distinguish the original sound from the additional gusts that hurried, heaving into the cave, merging and amplifying the song. And it was a song. A long, sustained, single note, like the tuning up of an orchestra, with all of the subtle variations and individual cadences that suggested. It grew louder and louder, more and more beautiful. It really was. Nina realised that she was weeping. She pulled down the headphones. Clay was watching her, but his interest wasn't voyeuristic, only indicating his happiness and confidence that they were experiencing something in precisely the same manner. The reverberating hum transcended language. Nina struggled to determine her response to it. It was as if it was replacing the air with something fluid. And this fluid something connected the pair of them, she and Clay, and also tethered them to the rock, the lichen, the packed soil, the roots, the gleaming white shards. Nina raised her hands and the song tingled on her fingertips. It really was. And then it began to abate. The orchestra had readied itself, but the symphony failed to come. Each individual player dropped away. When the final steady drone lessened and then ceased, Nina was aghast at her sense of emptiness. So, um, yeah, so Hope Island is, is available now. Um, it's creepy and it gets weirder and it gets more alien as it progresses. Um, I, th I think it's good. Um, and that's it for me for now, I think. I hope you're all well and managing with lockdown and reading lots. And if you're a writer, managing to write. Um, I guess that's not easy right now. Um, but yeah, I don't know about you, but I feel like I need fiction more than before rather than less. So um, yeah, that's what we, we have. Okay, I'll sign off. Bye now.